Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the award ceremony for the library's third annual short story contest. Uh, my name is Salim. Uh, I coordinate the writers workshop series and annual contest, and I will be serving as your host tonight. Tonight, we'll listen to readings of the top three stories um, and hear feedback from our judges, who I'd like to now introduce. Ashanti Files is the current poet laureate for the city of Urbana. Uh, her poetry and fiction have appeared in publications such as the Northern New England Review and their front lines, Poetry of Nursing and Pandemic Perspectives. John Milas is a local author and creative writing instructor. He earned his Master of Fine Arts in Fiction from Purdue University, and his fiction has appeared in publications such as the Southampton Review, Chicago Quarterly Review, and many more. And finally, Molly Thornton is a multi-genre writer and writing coach. Her writing appears in the LA Times, Lavender Review, They Said Anthology, and more. She is also a Lambda Literary Fellow and Pride Poet. Judges, thank you so much for being here tonight. So without further ado, uh, let's find out who the winning stories are. So starting with our third place prize. In third place, winning a one-year subscription to Writer's Digest magazine and their story published on our website is The Story An Unkindness of Ravens, written by Louise Audrith. Congratulations, Louise. Uh, we will now hear a reading of An Unkindness of Ravens, uh, followed by feedback from our judges. An Unkindness of Ravens. Linda tossed and turned in her sleep. She was ordinarily a quiet sleeper, never turning over more than once during the night. She always fell asleep on her left side to aid digestion, her doctor told her, and woke up on her right side. Sometimes she had no memory of rolling from one side to the other. But this night, she rolled from side to side. She flipped over onto her stomach, thinking that might be more comfortable. But soon, the acute angle of her neck made it start to cramp, and she had to move again. She tried her back. It was better, but as she totally relaxed into sleep, the flesh in the back of her throat sagged enough to make her snore. She turned back onto her left side, determined to start over and put herself to sleep. Eventually, she drifted off. She immediately found herself in the company of a large black bird, a raven, if biology class had been any help at all. It spoke, not enough. It declared, what's not enough? She questioned, me? What does this even mean? It stared at her with its large black raven eye. Not enough. The raven flew off, leaving her alone in the dark empty space of her dream. When her alarm jangled her awake, she felt she hadn't slept at all. What a night. She told herself it must have been the taco she'd had for supper or the glass of wine she'd drunk before bed. But the raven flapped in the periphery of her thoughts again and again as she went about her day. Work on a llama illustration all morning, lunch with her former co-worker and fellow retiree Glenda, then yoga class and attending a lecture on awareness in the multiverse at the Entity Bookstore downtown in the evening. During the pauses between all these activities, Linda found the raven waiting, coming to rest in her innermost being and pronouncing its judgment again and again. What was she to make of this? Nothing, her practical self told her querulous self. Dreams are just your subconscious mind sorting out feelings from your waking activities. The raven is telling you that you want more from life, more creative outlets, more adventure, more love. Maybe I should take that drawing class. Old birds, no pun intended can learn new techniques. I could teach that class, but I may also learn something new and meet new people. That night, the raven brought a friend. The two took turns throwing insults at Linda all night. Not enough, lacking. Linda decided to stay in bed when her alarm went off. She rolled over, 
back to her left side and pulled the covers up in a resolute manner, shutting her eyes firmly against the insinuating daylight. No use. Linda was the kind of person who, once awake, simply had to get up. She never understood how her grandsons could laze around in bed until nearly noon or go back to bed after eating breakfast. Again, she had a full day planned, treadmill and weights at the gym, grocery shopping, then putzing around in her studio in the afternoon. She still had a few finishing touches to put on that llama. Then she started messing around with her black markers and some iridescent watercolors. Pretty soon, she had a couple pictures of large black birds. My God, they're ravens. Linda had never been interested in drawing birds. She'd done a couple parrots a few years ago for a local fundraiser because it was a Caribbean themed event. But she didn't really understand the anatomy of birds and felt the ones she drew always looked awkward. These ravens though, look pretty good. Maybe she should do more. By midnight, when she finally snapped the lid on her marker and pinned the last one to her corkboard wall, she had a whole flock of them. What is a flock of ravens called, she wondered. A flock of hens is a brood. A flock of geese is a gaggle. Hmm. She Googled it. A group of ravens is an unkindness. An unkindness of ravens. The whole unkindness alit in her dream landscape that night judged her and found her wanting. When she woke up, she went immediately, immediately to her studio, tore all the raven drawings down and stuffed them in the wastebasket. Then she took a long look at the llama illustration. What was I thinking? This is disgusting. I can't send this to the magazine. It's amateurish, it's awful. It's not enough. She stuffed the llama in the wastebasket with the ravens. Now what, start over? So she spent the better part of the day and half the night working on another, better, llama. This one would have to do. The deadline was approaching. She'd have to overnight it now. Not enough, stated the bird. Not enough. Lacking, added its companion. Pitiful, threw in another. Disgusting, small, pathetic. The entire unkindness of them hurled abuse at her all night. A week later, she stood in front of the mirror naked after her morning shower. A woman in her 70s should never let the world see her naked, she thought. Some things are best left hidden away, tucked and shaped by secret influences into what we would have the world see. The real unadulterated truth is just too ugly to be laid bare. With thoughts of her own inadequacy pecking at her ego, she dressed and began her day. She should be hearing back from the about the llama illustration by now. Maybe the magazine was rejecting her pitiful effort and wanted their down payment back. Maybe they were trying to come up with a kind way to tell her how awful it was. Linda had retired from a career as a graphic designer, but the really creative hand-drawn and hand-painted art was something she'd saved for her retirement years, a kind of second career where she could spend time in her studio space, a converted spare bedroom in her house, and produce whatever art fit her fancy, then sell it for large amounts of money. She was still working on the money part. But she had attracted the children's magazine. They had sent her half of their compensation to do the llama. They promised the rest on acceptance. Now she was afraid that was unlikely to happen. As she headed out the door toward her car, she looked up into the large silver maple tree along the street side of the front sidewalk. Perched up near the top along a large horizontal branch sat a small group, a tiny unkindness of ravens. They were silent, all of them looking back at her with their black marble eyes. Then they began to comment among themselves. Her clothes were wrong, her hair was dowdy, her makeup was garish. How could she possibly go out in public looking like that? And when did she ever gotten the idea she could be an artist? The Ravens were telling her she might as well give up now. None of her art was ever going to be good enough. She might as well have stayed in bed. She was old, dull, past her prime, untalented and pitiful. Why even bother? 
Feeling weighed down with doubts, she pulled out her phone and called the bookstore where she'd been headed to volunteer to say she was feeling under the weather and wouldn't be in today. With a wary glance over her shoulder at the Ravens, she hurried back inside, locked the door and lay down on the couch. The Ravens were right. She had no business thinking she could have a second career as an artist. Who was she kidding? She needed to retire for real, retire from trying to remake herself, retire from life. She pulled the Afghan up and closed her eyes. The Ravens guffawed. She slept. And again, the Ravens, the entire unkindness of them, flapped and cawed their way into her dreams. They mocked her. They threw insults. They made lewd comments about her parents. They belittled her dead husband, Harry. Now that went too far. She sat up and looked out the window. The tree out front was full of them. There must have been two dozen of the large birds clacking and shifting in the tree. It was like a scene from that old Alfred Hitchcock movie. What if they started attacking? No sooner had the thought entered Linda's mind than she heard a thunk on the roof just above the window. Then another. Whap! A large black object hit the picture window. Another raven. Now the whole unkindness was in the air, flapping and cawing around her house. She pulled the drapes closed, went to the back and drew the blinds. Eventually, the racket outside stopped. Now she was scared, really scared. They were out there waiting for her. She could picture them. They were sitting in that tree, just waiting for her to stick her head out the door or make a run for her car. Then they'd be in the air again and the attack would start. Somehow she managed to make it through the rest of the afternoon and ate a simple solitary meal of leftover soup. She went into her studio and spent a little time tidying up, but never actually got around to doing anything productive. A little after nine, she put herself to bed. The dream started immediately. First, she was alone in the dark. Then she heard the dry rustling of feathers all around her. Suddenly, the air was full of flapping, cackling ravens bumping into her and each other in their frenzied activity. A hard beak hit her cheek. Sharp claws ripped at her shoulder. She screamed and tried to protect herself by flinging her arms up and woke herself. Now she felt foolish, trying to defend herself from imaginary attacks, but her cheek felt bruised and her shoulder still smarted. She got up and peeked out between the slats and the blinds that covered her bedroom window. It was directly above her living room and looked out level with the tree that had been full of ravens earlier. She couldn't quite tell in the dark, but it seemed like shadows darker than the surrounding night hunched along the large and small branches of the tree. She got back in bed and slept uneasily till morning when she was awakened by the taunts of the ravens again. Not enough lacking, inadequate. She covered her ears and turned over, trying to ignore the noise, but the whole unkindness was making a cacophony in her front yard, right outside her window. She decided to call animal control. Maybe they could do something. She got up and dressed quickly, and while she sipped her coffee, she punched in the number for animal control. Ma'am, you'll have to call in a bird specialist. Somebody from a pet store can help. They have fake owls you can put out to discourage birds or, don't you understand? These aren't starlings, they're ravens. They're big birds. They're threatening me. How do you mean? They say things. I mean, they make a lot of noise. And yesterday, a couple of them hit my house. Isn't there anything you can do? We can send somebody over to chase them away, but they'll probably just come back. You could get one of those recordings of a hawk and play it on a loop. Sometimes that keeps pest birds away. Never mind. Thanks anyway. Discouraged, she sat undecided on the couch. What could she do? Another thunk on the picture window attracted her attention. She opened the drapes to get a better look. The ravens were taking flight from the tree and began hurtling themselves at the roof and sides of her house. The cawing and flapping and yelling of insults became louder and louder. She heard glass break upstairs and the dry rustling sound of wings became louder. 
five or six of the things funneled their way down the stairs into the living room. Linda threw the afghan from the couch over her head and tried to make her way to the downstairs bathroom. If she could get in there and shut the door, she could get away from them. But she need, she'd need her phone to call for help. Where was it? She'd left it by her coffee cup. She felt a sharp thwack on the top of her head. Ouch! The blow momentarily stunned her. She reached up with her right hand out from under the afghan and felt a rip in the fabric and wetness on her scalp. When she pulled her hand back under the afghan and held it in front of her face, there was blood on the fingertips. The little bugger had pecked her on the head. Maybe she could get them out of the house. She moved to the front door and pulled it open and about 20 of the huge blackbirds pelted the storm door, threatening to break that glass as well. She quickly slammed the front door and locked it again for good measure. She thought again of her phone. She had to get help. As she moved toward the coffee table where her phone sat, the birds in the house came at her again. One hit her back like someone had swung a pickaxe. Another one landed on her shoulder and dug in with its claws while proceeding to peck through the afghan at her temple and cheek. She screamed and flapped her arms, making it let go. She needed to get to the bathroom so she could think, but by now she was disoriented. She couldn't see anything but the floor with the afghan draped over her head, and she didn't dare remove it. They'd be at her eyes. She tripped over a chair leg. That shouldn't be there, she thought. She was turned around, lost in her own living room. She lost her balance and fell, landing beside the coffee table she'd been trying to reach. His beaks and claws and stiff dry feathers pummeled her from all angles. She managed to grab her phone and dial 911. 911, please state your name and your emergency. An unkindness. I'm being attacked by an unkindness. Name and address, please. Ma'am, ma'am, are you still there? All the dispatcher on the phone heard was screaming then rustling and cackling and strange sounded voices, sounding voices saying, not enough, lacking. Thank you, Louise. We'll now hear feedback from our judges, starting with Ashanti. Louise, it was truly a delight to read your work. Um, I feel as though your practice and your craft was evident with your words on the page. Um, my feedback was I wanted to know a little bit more about the character. I love the way that you described her naked body as some things are best hidden away. And it was like a magnificent little jewel snuggled within the words themselves. Um, I wanted to know a little bit more about her art studio because she spends so much time there. And the focus of the story is how she's transitioning in retirement and attempting to consider her art career and possibly expand it. And she's being hackled by these ravens who are kind of preying on her insecurity. So my best feedback was give us more about her art studio and the llama that she's creating. But overall, it was magnificent. Next, we'll hear from John. Uh, hi, Louise. Congratulations. Uh, we were told that uh, you had won an award last year, so I wanted to say, like, I wanted to reflect um, on that achievement of doing that with a different group of judges. I think that's really impressive. Um, I thought an unkindness of Ravens was really successful in evoking a creepy tone throughout, like a an Edgar Allan Poe story in a contemporary setting. Um, I sort of wondered throughout the, the piece whether things were taking place in dreams or reality. Um, I thought the way the ravens embodied self-doubt and, uh, and insecurity, the way they did that was working really well. Um, and I, the thing I enjoyed about the final scene uh, is the way the story closes on an ambiguous note uh, where not every question is directly answered. Um, and that keeps the piece in my head, you know, after I'm done reading it. Um, and I definitely got the feel from, from reading the story that you spent time reading and writing, and I think it showed throughout. So definitely a good job and congratulations again.
And finally, we'll hear from Molly. Hi, Louise. I really enjoyed this story and the metaphors and play of the term unkindness and especially how it dissolves into both a vagueness and a specificity at the same time when Linda attempts to alert the authority she's under attack and states only that she's staving off un an unkindness. And I resonated with the way that unkindness begins in her subconscious, but then pops up even when she's trying to shake it off and how it becomes increasingly obtrusive as metaphorically our fears and doubts often do. And one line that I loved that sums up the theme and that wordplay of the story is with the thoughts of her own inadequacy pecking at her ego, she dressed and began her day. Thank you for sharing this story with us, Louise, and congrats. Thank you, judges, and congrats again, Louise. Yep. Moving on to our second place prize. In second place, also winning a one-year subscription to Writer's Digest magazine and their story published on our website is the story, Good Things, written by Jay Barr. Congrats, Jay. Uh, Jay will now read his story, Good Things, followed again by feedback from our judges. This is called Good Things. I got a flat tire on my way to kill David Delilah. After finally figuring out how to jack the car up high enough for the tire to lift off the cracked pavement, I narrowly escaped being crushed as my Mercedes S-Class lurched forward, the jack clattering to the ground. The second time I got it lifted up, I realized the silver things were hard to unscrew as the wheel continued to spin in midair. Another 25 minutes of struggling with the T-shaped bar later, not sure what that thing is called. I finally gave in and called my Platinum Plus roadside assistance. While on a brief hold, I pictured David Delilah's frog-like face sneering down at me as I crouched by the deflated rubber. I made a mental list of witnesses who had seen me since I left home. One. The dark-skinned mover in a black golf shirt carrying a bundle of garment bags from a nearby U-Haul toward the stately front entrance of the recently sold house next door. I tried to signal him over with a few snaps of my fingers, intending to ask him when the new owners would be arriving, but he just looked at me incredulously and continued on with the garment bags. Probably a Haitian refugee that made it across the border somehow, I surmise. No English yet. He would not want to speak with the police. The surprisingly unpierced barista at the coffee shop where I ordered my go-to iced white mocha with low-fat oat milk, caramel, and salted cream cold foam had three pumps of hazelnut, two pumps cinnamon dolce, and a drizzle of chestnut praline syrup. After waiting over four minutes, I went back to the counter and got into it with her a little bit about my weight, but not likely that she would remember. Three, a portly customer waiting for his own coffee, giving me the stink eye behind his thick glasses. He pointed at his covered face, shaking his head. I don't own a mask, I told him with a smile. It was one of my favorite things to say to strangers, along with, I don't carry small bills to panhandlers. Or, though we mainly saw each other through her rearview mirror, the motorist with a, the chief is hostile and abusive bumper sticker. After tailgating her for several blocks, I passed her on the shoulder, feeling some kind of thump under one of the tires as I zoomed around her in a blur. Five, now the tire changer guy. After he got out of the tow truck, clipboard in hand, he did a double take and his eyes narrowed as he looked me over. Um, hi, he said, you're not. Um, I sighed briefly and forced a smile. No Aussie accent here, mate, but I get that all the time, I said, eager to finish the interaction, but he went on. I didn't think so, but you do look like him. I'm a big fan of those movies. Love that giant hammer you used to have, Thor, he chuckled. I gave a final pain smile and pretended to make a phone call. I parked a few driveways down from David Delilah's house in Brittany Trails, noting with some satisfaction that my stonemason crafted the mailbox was far superior to his post-mounted one, and my landscapers clearly paid much more attention to detail than whoever he was using. Aaron's car was not in the driveway, at least. I started planning this little mission during my three-week stay at the Dreams All-Inclusive Resort in Tulum, technically a business trip. Our most profitable divisions in the past year have been retail cannabis, and housing nonviolent drug offenders from other states. So the company paid for everything since there was a prison privatization conference in neighboring Mexico City. 
As all of the cab drivers parked out front said it was much too far to take me to the convention center for some reason, I just stayed at the resort. By the end of the stay, my veins flowed with those keys and I added a third of keys at the local massage parlors, but at least it was all tax deductible for father. He took charge of the company after grandpa died and someday I will take over for him. My family have always been winners. In 1941, grandpa was on the verge of closing the family business, the second biggest factory in the area. However, when old man Sato, the owner of our biggest competitor, went away in 42, this in turn meant that grandpa could combine the two plants into the wartime juggernaut that became our current company. Chip off the old block, grandpa. His grandfather before him overcame the unbelievable misfortune of having his most valuable property taken from him in 1863 later managing to innovate some different kind of arrangement to stay afloat, proper sharing, I think he called it. Great grandpa later founded the original factory with loans from some other members of the organization he was involved with in the 1920s, the White Knights. I always enjoyed hearing grandpa talk about the family history, though I did not always understand his jokes. The one he used to say about Sato was, one man's anar is another man's treasure, then he would crack up whatever anar is. I first discovered David Delilah while watching a Facebook video of a birthday party at Chuck E. Cheese posted by one of Karen's friends. Since Karen was not tagged in the post, I almost missed it, but after repeated viewings and despite the fact that they were never close to each other on camera, it became obvious from the various clues in the video that her seat was next to David Delilah's at the long table. Clearly then they were fucked. He worked for a small company specializing in self-driving car technology, a space that we were trying to expand into with minimal success. Further research into his social media habits confirmed my worst suspicions. He was a liberal douchebag. Karen had even stopped retweeting evidence for the Biden impeachment. Despite her wanting to claim, claiming to want to co-parent our son, I definitely knew something was wrong. She did not support my request to transfer our first grader to another private school after he was suspended for starting a build the wall chant during a forced viewing of a Cesar Chavez propaganda documentary. Snapping out of my reverie, I leaned forward on the aftermarket Argentinian leather seat as the larger door of the Delilah three-car garage opened. There he was, rolling an apparently empty red trash can back inside the garage from the curb. I eased the car door closed and started to stride purposely toward him, Grandpa's favorite handgun tucked in the back of my $600 jeans. Ducking under the closing garage door while stepping over the infrared safety sensor, I was abruptly left in the dark when the heavy wood finished its descent. Entering the spacious and well-lit kitchen, I remembered a thought that first occurred to me the night I lost my virginity. To spend a minute inside a stranger's home is not so different from encountering an alien civilization for the first time. This little green man, and he did have on a pea green button down, was replacing the garbage bag in the kitchen trash can. He let out a startled yelp when he saw me, his eyes growing wider still as I wriggled the grayish gun from the tight grip of my $300 belt. Oh, fuh, he stammered before I silenced him with the wave of the barrel. Sit down, David, I commanded. He obeyed slowly, never taking those beady eyes off the meadow. Do you know who I am? I can see his mind working. No one else knows, he suddenly gushed. I figured it out last month. Not even corporate knows what this means yet. He noticed me hesitating. No, I don't know who you are, but I can catch you in. We take it to Google, Uber, Tesla, whoever. I'm going to give my notice and shut up, I barked. Then I softened my tone, setting down across from him at the kitchen table, and now pointed at his midsection. Tell me exactly what you are offering. This discovery is going to revolutionize level five cloud connected autonomy, actual B2X. No one else knows, but you need me, he whined. And Karen, a confused look washed over his amphibian features. Who was Karen? That's right, David, that's a good way to play this. I stood up, returning the gun to the small of my back. We'll be in touch, we know where to find you. I may never have been QB1, but I know how to call an audience. Aaron, he said again, before a sudden recognition hit his voice. Oh, Karen, from the birthday party, echoed in the hallway as I walked out the front door. I called father as soon as I got away from the curb. I have something for the company. It's big, I gloated on the voicemail. Call me when you can. Father is going to be so proud, maybe more than he has been since I scared off those Potawatomi who claimed our headquarters was built on their ancestral burial grounds. Approaching home, I heard the faint sound of sirens behind me in the distance. And the same thought came to my mind that always does when I hear that sweet blue sound. Hope you catch them, boys. Pulling into my driveway, I noticed the mover next door had inexplicably brought a woman and two children with him to work. I parked in the garage and carefully peeked around the corner. They all stood in the high and wide archway of the front porch, looking up at the beautiful facade. The mover held what looked to be an expensive stolen bottle of the new homeowner's champagne. 
and he cheerfully clinked glasses with the attractive woman. I took my head and went outside, went inside, muttering to myself that I will never understand why good things happen to bad people. Thank you, Jay. And back to our judges for feedback for the story, Good Things. Jay, I love to hate to say it, but I hated your character. I immediately hated him so wholly and completely. He was so well written that I imagined he was my neighbor that I avoided all costs. It takes true talent to write such an abhorrent character. I love the way you integrated his personality so well with the settings and provided backstory for his despicable moves. Exceptional job. Uh, hi, Jail. Uh, for good things, um, on my first read, I was like kind of taken aback. I wasn't really sure what I was getting into um, as the voice sort of you know took hold. But I think, you know, in order to write fiction, uh, we need to be able to embody all types of voices, even ones that are unsavory or make us uncomfortable. And uh, there's a lot of discussion in student workshops these days um, around whether characters are likable or relatable. And I think you did what's most important with this story, which is to write an engaging and well-drawn character. Uh, good things is is strong partly for its voice, but also because um, in general, it's never boring at all. Um, I think the, the closing line uh, demonstrates the self-awareness of the piece um, and the sentence level writing was very, very respectable. Uh, and I should also add the first sentence, the opening sentence of the story is really great as well. So congratulations uh, on winning the second place. I also noted right off the bat, I was hooked on the story from the setup of the first line, I got a flat tire on my way to kill David Delilah. There's enough in that to just make you want to keep reading for a long time. So I love how in this story, you cleverly wink at the reader through the narrator's biases, assumptions, and his righteous observations and actions. And I love how the character is so dedicated to his assumptions about others that he sees them even when they're not there. For instance, the unpierced barista. And the story swerves away from murder in a direction that's logical but unexpected and makes a really satisfying tale and leaving us with one more dose of his sheer obliviousness. So thank you so much and congrats. Thank you judges and congrats again, Jay. And finally, the story taking home the grand prize for best short story in 2021, winning a one-on-one -on -one consultation with Ted Sanders, who is the director of creative writing at the University of Illinois, a headshot for their author portfolio and their story published on our website for the community to read is the story, A Portrait of Entropy, written by James Smith. Reading A Portrait of Entropy is local author and writing instructor, Molly McRae. A Portrait of Entropy by James F. Smith. For the first time in so long, Cell was unbothered by the city, entranced as she was by a flyer which read, not happy, Metamorphose with transgraft surgery, and a pair of pictures below. First showed a man saying, transgraft gave me a better life. The second was a wolf saying, now I'm my own best friend. An array of like pairs followed, befores and afters of people turned into a variety of popular animals, tigers, hawks, dolphins. But what drew Sell's attention was the final pair of the set, a woman who had become a rhododendron. Heart pounding, Cell pocketed the flyer, resuming her trek through the city, and for the first time in so long, her mind was occupied with something other than gremlins. 
The city seemed to extend forever in all directions. It was precise. It was efficient. It was neat. Traffic did not exist. The weather, though artificial, was always beautiful. People, nobody wanted food or home. Many would proudly call it an impressive achievement of technology. Cell would call it an impressive assembly of detritus. Perfect tower after perfect tower laid out in tiny rows, crammed into just enough space with barely enough left to breathe. Roads and walkways crisscrossed at points up and down their full heights. Up and away, they formed a lattice through, the, through which no sky shone. Artificial light lit the whole of the city. Cell doubted if even the canopy was, un, was sunlit. Probably the city had eaten the sun long ago and its artificial substitute was cold and blinding as it reflected off shiny steel surfaces. Nearly everything was steel. The buildings, their rooms, the roads, the cars, the walkways, and so on. Indeed, Sel thought, there is more steel than people. In fact, even some of the people were steel. There was little tolerance in the city's efficiencies for slow, uncoordinated, inconsistent humans Robots for most tasks were superior. Most people were unemployed. The city paid them a stipend to live and they used it to pay the city for the things it made. How aimless, thought Sel. She wondered if she marked a bill and used it to pay rent, how long would it take before it returned to her and her stipend? Not long, she wagered. There were still some jobs for which robots were ill-suited, plumbers, police, engineers, etc., and the employed made extra money on their stipend. Sel did not. She was an artist, which was not something a robot could do at all, but artist was not a job, according to the city. Sel's first painting was a portrait of the city, as carefully laid out on the canvas as it was in reality. Translucent, greasy brown streaks were hastily slapped hither and thither over the buildings, and affixed to them were tiny soft hairs, giving the effect of a fuzzy brown mold, which smelled just as rank. Fuzzy brown was what Cell saw whenever she watched the lower levels of the city. So many people squirming, merging into a single undulating mass. She often thought of all the robots, people, and steel that she couldn't see, stuffed into buildings, trying to squirt onto the streets, which were already past capacity. However, for all their abundance, people, steel, and robots made up only a tiny minority of the city's stuffing. If Cell were to sort out the city's components by proportional weight, this would be that list. One, trace elements, 0.5%. Two, robots, 1.5%. Three, people, 3%. Four, steel, 5%. Five, gremlins, 90%. Gremlins, like cock, oozed from every crevice. They crawled on every wall. They sputtered from every car. They dripped from people like sweat, and they leaked like oil from every robot. Everything produced gremlins, and nobody seemed to notice. Cell did, though, and she knew that someday she would drown in them. Cell took measures to defer that day. For one, she practiced catatonia, moving, breathing, and thinking as little as possible, minimizing the gremlins flowing into her life. Thinking little, however, was difficult. Cell was not an engineer. Her brain was not a squishy computer that could just switch off. It had a mind of its own. Cell thought an engineer would say that statement was stupid and redundant, but she would argue that it was poetic. She often lost herself down those sorts of meta-thought tunnels while gremlins gushed from her ears. Second, her apartment was, an engineer might say, Spartan. Cell called it clean. She had only some essentials, a stove, a sink, a bowl, a spoon, a ceiling, a floor, and a few non-essentials, canvas and paints, a toothbrush, a bed, and some houseplants. Houseplants, among the non-essentials, were the most essential. They were beautiful and made better companions than dogs or cats or anything else. Taking care of them gave her purpose. 
she admired them. Of all living things, plants produced the fewest gremlins, fewer even than a catatonic cell. Those paragons of living are what she spent her stipend on, the only things worth anything. She could, one could be excused for thinking her walls were green for all the Schefflera, Monstera, and Pothos, which lined every shelf, corner, and sill. Cell began her days with catatonia. She lay staring at her plants, envious of the trickle of gremlins beating on their leaves. Her breath alone dwarfed their combined output. She would wonder, what's the point? I should just root here until a self-loathing dread crept from her gut to her head. Then her thoughts would turn, I am waste. At least plants make oxygen. And like so, every morning she got up. Cell spent the middles of her days tending her plants and painting. Actually, what she called painting was sitting, staring, and sighing in front of an empty canvas, thinking the day was lost. Sometimes, though, a vision would strike and she would paint in the traditional sense. It should be said at this point that many artists made money selling their work. Sell did not. She tried, but it almost never worked out. Almost should not be taken to mean a general infrequency of sales. It should be taken to mean absolutely no sales ever, with exactly one exception. Cell exhibited at a coffee shop where several other more popular artists also exhibited. It was the only space she liked outside of her apartment. The tea was good, the lighting was warm, and plants abounded. She also enjoyed surrounding herself with others' art, mostly because it made her feel better about her own. She may have sold fewer than anyone, but her works held to a higher aesthetic value. On the morning of her only sale, Cell sipped tea at a table beside her painting. It was of a cow in a field beneath a dark cloud. On one half, the cow was eating the field in vast mouthfuls, leaving behind barren land. On the other, the cow excreted a tiny pellet onto a plate ready to eat, and a cloud of gremlins that billowed covering the sky. Cell watched patrons filter in and evaluate art. Most did not go near hers, preferring instead pretentious portraits and paintings of pretty ponies pantsing, prancing in pastures. Cell watched one woman in particular who contemplated every work as though each was some long lost Vermeer. Here was a woman with absolutely no taste. What's to contemplate, Cell thought to herself. This would go great in my bathroom. Mocking the woman's awe, Cell swept her arm out grandly. In doing so, she knocked her teacup from the table. It shattered on the floor, shooting gremlins off like bullets into the crowd that now stared at Cell. She froze and thought, go to hell, slack jaws. You're worse than a thousand cups. After a brief eternity, time resumed. A bus spot hurried over to clean the mess, and all the patrons returned to their own business all except one. The woman Cell had mocked crossed the room to Cell's painting. Between the bus spot cleaning up, Cell's embarrassment, and the tasteless stranger scrutinizing her work, Cell was beginning to feel overcrowded. Gremlins churned in her gut and flushed her face. She went to sip tea to hide behind her cup, but it was gone. Tense, she thought, I want to go home. The stranger, lost in thought, wore a neutral expression. Cell watched for the satisfying moment it turned sour, when the woman would grimace and Cell could say, you don't like art, you like decoration. But that moment never came. The woman did not sneer or shake her head or even walk away. She laughed. This is great, she said, grinning at the cow's excretions. She turned and asked Cell, what's it called? The gremlins in Cell's body built pressure and burst from her pores. They ran down, flooding the table. She sat still and waited, but the woman persisted. Eventually, Cell relented. Net gain. The woman smiled again. I like it, she said. I was thinking the second law, but that's better, punchier, she chuckled. 
that makes you Selene, right? I'm an enemy. I gotta say, it's striking, the painting. Shocking too, it, I really resonate with it. This woman talked too much. Cell winced every time an enemy's mouth flapped, loosing stray jets of gremlins with every word. Mind if I sit? She did not wait for permission. As an enemy sat, the bus spot rose, having collected the cup shards. An enemy caught its attention and asked, can I have those? Cell noted its hesitation. The cup was worthless trash now, but there was certainly a policy against handing out, handing over anything for free. However, it would soon be tossed out with the garbage, effectively becoming public pro property, so why not short circuit the whole ceremony and hand it, hand it over now? After a moment, it did, and Cell thought, for that matter, everything will be trash soon, so why not give it all out for free? Anemone laid the pieces out on the table like a puzzle and started rearranging them. Gremlins boiled Cell's head as she steeled herself and honed a few curt words for her guest. Allowing minimal gremlins to escape, she said, go away. You an artist full time? Or is it more of a side thing? Asked Anemone. She finished laying out a flat approximation of the cup. Then she reached into her pocket and produced a small tube of glue. To Cell's horror, the woman uncapped it, sprang out a fountain of gremlins. Hmm? Prompted an enemy. Anemone. Cell said, I am now. I used to be an engineer. Ah, it's all coming together. Anemone proceeded to glue the edges of her pieces. I'm an engineer myself. Cell frowned. Anemone started reassembling the cup and said, how much? That winded Cell. What? The painting. You want to buy it? Why? Because I was an engineer? She watched Anemone fit edges together as gremlins sprang from every seam. Anemone laughed. But not just that, no. I think we have more in common. She finished the cup, smiling proudly. Cell could hardly look at the cup. It and Anemone's hands were encrusted in gremlins. How so, she asked. Anemone tilted forward. Cell recoiled slightly. Then Anemone tapped the repaired cup, sending out a ring and a shower of gremlins. Cell winced and nearly missed what the engineer whispered next. I see them too. Cell stiffened. Her mind wiped of all thoughts save one, I want to go home. Anemone relaxed, pausing for Cell to breathe. Then she continued. I thought I saw myself sitting here next to something I might have made, if I had the skill I mean. She smiled fondly at the cow in the field. Nostalgic. Finally, quivering, Cell asked, How do you... Function? Finished Anemone. Cell nodded. Anemone shrugged. Mostly I got used to them. Cell's heart sank. But I've also got a secret weapon, said Anemone, leaning in again. This time Cell leaned in too, and Anemone told her, I have a machine. It doesn't make a single one. She shook her head. None. Impossible, said Cell. Anemone smirked. It hums away all day long, and not a single one pops out. Clean. A shiver ran down Cell's spine. Anemone added, whenever I feel like I'm drowning, I just watch the machine. It sets me right again. She eyed Cell for a moment. Would you like to see it? Yes. Okay, said Anemone. Tell you what, give me that painting and I will show you the machine. Okay, said Cell. Beautiful, said Anemone. Let's go. The machine was displayed under a glass case beneath can lights in Anemone's living room, which was otherwise Spartan. The machine was made up of delicate cogs and shafts and hoses running hither and thither throughout the case. Every piece pushed and slid and turned patiently, perpetually. They moved in a hypnotic pattern and nary a gremlin could sell see. Anemone presented it with an exaggerated bow, saying, and here is the only thing I ever made worth anything. A piece came over Cell, and she asked, what does it do? 
It's not what it does, said Anemone. It's what it doesn't. But every machine does something, said Cell. Not this one, said Anemone, leaning against the display case like a confident saleswoman. What does your painting do? Cell nodded, half listening. She stared at the machine for some time, then said, can I stay here? Yeah, replied Anemone, sure. Cell investigated the machine all night, circling it, scrutinizing it with an engineer's eyes. She needed to know how it did its miracle or if it was lying. Meanwhile, Anemone studied Cell, warmly smiling and silently standing out of the way, answering the latter's questions with a sly grin and a shrug. I don't know. The machine proved inscrutable, and early the next morning, after Anemone retired to bed, Cell settled, transfixed, in front of the machine. The, the world melted away, a tide receding. Emptiness filled her. She thought of Catatonia, which paled in comparison and found it no longer held any charm. No more gremlins dripped from her, and she noticed they had disappeared from the surrounding room as well. So this is Nirvana, she thought. Then she saw it, deep within the machine, between the meshing teeth of cogs, beneath a lattice of links and levers, a single gremlin oozed. It was only there briefly before some wind sucked it away, but she saw it. Cell decided to pretend she had seen nothing. She rose onto shaking legs and stepped out into the city. For once, it was clean, Cell breathed relief and started home. Along the way, now and then, she thought she saw a gremlin bouncing in the corner of her eye. When she did, she just put her head down, stuffed her hands into her pockets, and carried on. And in her pockets, she found a folded flyer advertising an affordable outpatient procedure that could remake her into a peace lily. Her heart pounded. She made to throw it in the nearest bin, but found she could not let it go. Thank you, Molly. And now back to our judges uh, for feedback for the story, A Portrait of Entropy. Molly, that was a magnificent reading. <laughs> As One. a word artist, I just was, I could not let go of your voice and that's tremendous talent. Mr. Smith. As a poet, I clung, literally clung to your jewels. <laughs> I wrote them down. <laughs> Lost in the meta thought tunnels, proportional weight. Artist was not a job according to the city. I am waste, at least a plant makes oxygen. It's not what it does, it's what it doesn't. It was these words, this lyricism that kind of brought the story to life for me. Um, it was uniquely conceptualized. The character was engaging and the setting descriptions were phenomenally magnificent. Um, like I said, I'm a poet. I generally don't do creative writing, but I found myself going to your story again and again and again, and just wondering what would Sale think about this? How would Sale feel about that? So bravo and keeping me engaged in rereading. And I really, really, really look forward to more from you. So congratulations on winning first place. Thank you. Hey James, uh, we were all uh, really into the world building aspect of a portrait of uh, entropy. Um, there's a really strong sense of the place evoked in the details, which is obviously impressive because it takes place in the future. Uh, and you did a good job of doing all this without pausing, uh, you know, to overload the reader with paragraphs devoted exclusively to exposition. Um, I was really brought, you know, I really, I bought into the, the setting a lot, but the, the main character um, and the story, the big picture, you know, story that orbits mental health struggles and sort of following your passions in life. Um, it, it's all set in the future, but it's still about a story about now, you know, or that can be read as a story about now, which is when I think science fiction is working most successfully. Um, and the ending also evokes the beginning of, 
of something new. And as a reader, the possibilities stick with me as I go about my life after reading it. Um, and I also have to say there's a really commendable attention uh, to the writing at the sentence level um, and a really solid use of, of figurative language. You know, I would echo everything that Ashanti said as well, too. Um, there's really a lot of care put into the writing of the piece uh, reflected by the attention to the lower order mechanical concerns as well. So really, congratulations uh, on winning an award in the contest. Thank you. Hi, James. Since oh. I first read this story, it has stayed with me and the details of the gremlins and my mental image of the cafe and the feel of the tidy city are still vivid in my mind. I was highly impressed by the complexity and thoroughness of the world building and how successfully it's woven into the story and the life of the character Sal. I love the contrast of Sal's gremlins against the city, and I was just captivated by the story of how, through her non-decorative art, she finds someone who shares her problem and her perspective. And the more time I spend with this story, the more curious I am about it, and the more ways I can think to interpret it. It's really rich in craft and construction, as well as in its thematic elements. Um, so it's really exceptional and congratulations and thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, James. Thank you. Congratulations again uh, to our three winners, James, Louise, and Jay. Um, I also want to say thank you to everyone who submitted a story this year. Um, Every time we do this, it's always wonderful to see how much talent uh, and creativity we have in this community. So thank you for sharing your work with us. Uh, before we end, um, I wanna say thank you again to Molly McRae, our guest reader tonight. Uh, and thank you again to our judges, Ashanti Files, John Milas, and Molly Thornton for lending your time and expertise with us. And I wanna thank everyone for coming. I hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you soon. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>